Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! In a major speech today, M Myanmar's leader Aung San Suu Kyi has insisted her government has made every effort to bring peace to Rakhine State, where hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims have fled their homes. In recent weeks, 400,000 Rohingya Muslims have arrived in neighboring Bangladesh as a result of what the UN has called ethnic cleansing. Human rights groups have criticized Aung San Suu Kyi, saying the speech contained untruths and victim blaming. Jonah Fisher reports now from Myanmar. Myanmar's Nobel laureate arrived for her speech, a once unthinkable question hanging in the air. Ms Suu Kyi, have you become an apologist for ethnic cleansing? There was no reply. That's Aung San Suu Kyi's style the these days. Fled, in the last three weeks, 400,000 Rohingya Muslims have fled her country. And she's said very little. Ms Suu Kyi, do human rights still matter to you? Oh, oh. This televised address to diplomats was Ms. Suu Kyi's chance to state her case to the world. We feel deeply for the suffering of all the people who have been caught up, caught up in the conflict. Those who have had to flee their homes are many, not just Muslims and Rakhines, but also small minority groups. This was Ms. Suu Kyi giving the both sides defence. Overwhelmingly, the victims in this crisis have been the Rohingya. As to who was responsible for burning villages, she refused to point the finger. And then, to many people's surprise, there was this. We are concerned to hear that numbers of Muslims are fleeing across the border to Bangladesh. We want to find out why this exodus is happening. We would like to talk to those who have fled as well as to those who have stayed. This speech won't satisfy Ms. Suu Kyi's many critics. A generous reading of it is that she's badly out of touch. But the idea that she put forward that she doesn't know why hundreds of thousands of Rohingya have fled into Bangladesh, well, that simply beggars belief. Almost without exception, they say they're fleeing atrocities being committed by Burmese soldiers. Some observers have called it ethnic cleansing. Ultimately, Ms. Suu Kyi doesn't control the Burmese army, but its generals seem quietly pleased that it's her taking the flag. What will it take to stop the abuses? Why have so many people fled and why aren't your, your soldiers stopping the burning of villages? This is their strategic plot. The Rohingya were the ones who started attacking security forces. Then they ran away. They knew what they did, then got worried about it and ran away. Aung San Suu Kyi has made her choice. Her relationship with the military and the stability of her government comes before the Rohingya and what's left of her reputation. Jonah Fisher, BBC News, Naypyidaw. Well, President Trump's speech did not address the Myanmar crisis that's led to more than 400,000 Rohingya Muslims to flee their homeland. Myanmar's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, who cancelled her visit to the UN General Assembly, has refused to blame the army for the conflict. But in her first countrywide address on the issue, the Nobel Peace Laureate said that she felt deeply for the suffering of all people in the conflict. She made the address in English. Her statement seems to fly in the face of reports from the refugees who have spoken of burned villages, mass shootings and much worse. Our Asia correspondent Jonathan Miller reports tonight from Jol Paitoli, refugee camp right inside the border with Bangladesh, where Rohingyas fleeing the violence in Myanmar have been describing the horror that they've left behind. The UN Secretary General warned this speech would be her last chance to end the carnage in Rakhine. I'm aware of the fact that the world's attention is focused on the situation in Rakhine State. But in the face of overwhelming evidence of ethnic cleansing happening under her nose, Burma's political leader appeared both delusional and in denial. Since the 5th of September, there have been no armed clashes and there have been no clearance operations. Nevertheless, we are concerned to hear that numbers of Muslims 
are fleeing across the border to Bangladesh. We want to find out why this exodus is happening. We filmed eight villages ablaze on the 14th of September and from across the river in Bangladesh have watched many others burn before and since. Today, human rights groups accused Aung San Suu Kyi of lying and of fanning the flames that have raised more than 200 Rohingya villages, tens of thousands of homes. Today, we made our way to the land frontier and ended up in a makeshift hilltop camp inside no man's land where hundreds of Rohingya families have fled in terror. There will be many still clinging to the diminishing sliver of hope that Aung San Suu Kyi has a gun to her head, but her failure to condemn the atrocities of the Myanmar military and worse, to deny that they're even happening, would appear to confer on the Nobel Peace Laureate the very saddest title of all, Fallen Goddess. Accompanied by edgy Bangladeshi border guards, we went right up to the wire and looked directly into Rakhine State. Burmese border security patrols along this fence twice a day. Not far from here, they've laid landmines that have killed refugees as they've crossed. At the fence, I met a Rohingya rice farmer whose experience might enlighten Aung San Suu Kyi. That's my house over there, inside Burma. That's where my family has lived for 150 years, just a few yards from no man's land. After Eid prayers on Saturday the 2nd of September, Kafayatullah's brother Jarula and his wife Aisha were in the house with their three-year-old son when soldiers burst in. Jarula was shot through the chest and Aisha killed too. The villagers ran with Jerula's dead body towards the Bangladesh border. A villager can be heard on the phone saying, Kafayatullah's brother's been killed by the military. <laughs> Suddenly, there is panic. The army's coming, the army's coming, they shout as they run. As they reach the barbed wire, others gather as the horror begins to sink in. Back at the farmhouse, this young man said he'd found the three-year-old under his dead mother, all covered in blood. As he pulled him out, he realized he had somehow survived. Check the house again, he suddenly shouts. There might be someone else alive in there. There wasn't. Kafayatullah buried Jarula and Aisha inside Bangladesh after he too had fled with his young orphaned nephew. We had no option but to run into no man's land. It's not just because our rights were being denied, it's because we were being killed. Nearly half of the 500,000 Rohingya who fled are children, more than 1,300 of whom have been separated from their families. The UN Children's Agency has already set up more than 40 child-friendly areas in camps where they can play, draw, sing, dance, and sometimes laugh. Many are deeply affected by the terrible things they have seen. Children's charities say that in the camps, they're vulnerable to abuse, trafficking, child labor, child marriage. This boy is 10. Accompanied by a UN child protection officer, we spoke to him about his ordeal. The military came into our village three times. They killed people with machetes. When they began to burn our houses, villagers started running in every direction. I just held my little sister's hand and followed a group. Halim has looked everywhere for his mum and dad, but hasn't found them. It was really tough to walk all this way. As I don't have any parents, I'm living with other people. It's not like home, though. They're nice but I don't feel any love. Right now, needs are very basic. Food, water, shelter, health. Mental health problems will fester with time. They've gone through a traumatic episode. 
um, in terms of their displacement uh, and, and fleeing of violence. And now they're, they're moving into very difficult conditions here in, in the camps and you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about their future. You know, depression and anxiety are the, are the two big uh, types of mental health conditions that we see. Across the population or children in particular? Uh, Usually, we would find that the the majority would uh, the majority of cases are with women and children. On the day Aung San Suu Kyi buried her head in the sand, we passed the broken bamboo bridge where Rohingya are drowning in a sea of sorrows. This has been the biggest and fastest movement of refugees across any frontier since the Rwandan genocide. Twenty three years on. Is the United Nations competent to hold the perpetrators of the Rakhine atrocities to account? Or will they get away with murder in this dawning age of impunity? Strong with the mirror there. Now, I'm joined now from New York by Mona Khalil, an international lawyer with extensive experience in UN peace and security efforts. And by the former Tory MP and then head of humanitarian affairs and emergency relief at the UN, Sir Stephen O'Brien from Cheshire. Welcome to you both. Let me start with you, Sir Stephen. I mean, you heard uh, Jonathan Miller's report there. I mean, are they getting away with murder, the Burmese military? Are they getting away with impunity? Are we once again witnessing something that every time when it happens, we say never, ever again? I think you're absolutely right that there is a clear evidence here of 417,000 people, mainly women and children, crossing a border you don't do that unless there's a reason for you to flee and flee for your life. And for so many men who have not been able to keep with them, therefore they must be suffering if not killed. And for over 200 of those villages to be set ablaze. But notably, houses which belong to non-Muslims have not been set alight. Mm. So we can see the continuing discrimination. We can see the military activity. The facts speak for themselves. And of course, it was disappointing that the first state's councillor, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, chose not to uh, uh, make it clear that every citizen should have equal rights under the law and for her to use her moral authority and leadership uh, that would expect at least everybody to be included, whereas uh, the military do need to be held to account. And I think that's what now needs to be done. And I visited Myanmar myself last year. I went to Rakhine State. Mm. I went to Sitwe. I saw the enclave where the Muslims are suffering. Uh, and this is something where the United Nations where we've spoken up very loudly. We are reaching people for humanitarian needs, but in terms of the uh, opportunity to hold people to account, that, mm. I think, is where a lot more needs to happen. OK, Mona Khalil, let me talk, turn to you. I mean, not only are they not being held to account, but Aung San Suu Kyi, a Nobel Peace Laureate who was celebrated by the UN until recently, hasn't even bothered to show up and explain herself. I mean, where does that leave the credibility of the organization in the building behind you? Well, first and foremost, I think we have to recognize that the Rohingya community itself has shown more compassion for Aung San Suu Kyi than she has shown them. They have thus far held up the theory that she is under duress, that she has limited power to constrain her military. But time and time again, she has failed the faith of the Rohingya people, and she has betrayed the promises she has made in seeking to lead and represent her government. Mm. There is no under duress anymore. She has the support of Nobel laureates. She has the support of the Security Council. She has the support of most, if not all, of the super superpowers. There is no excuse for continuing to deny and continuing to mischaracterize the atrocities being committed in her name. Right. So, Stephen O'Brien, let me talk, turn to you about Donald Trump. I and mean, here we have the President of the United States uh, literally walking around the block from his old home in Trump Tower and shredding the very principles on which the UN is based, the principles of international solidarity and agreement in front of the General Assembly's eyes. Is this a low point for the organization? Well, I think that it's very clear that we have seen some amelioration in his words from the very strong rhetoric in the campaign. But even so, that it is a great worry that the tenets of multilateralism, which have served us well for the 72 years that the United Nations has sought to be the highest body for diplomacy and for negotiating, and above all, what we now know to be the case, which is that with 142 million people in need of humanitarian uh, aid as we speak, $23 billion required to service that, 
uh, it's because most of that, 90% or so, is out of conflict, man-made conflict, unresolved and not prevented. And so it's multilateralism through diplomacy that is so vital. And so, yes, I do listen to the rhetoric, but at the same time, I note that, and this is very much in tune with my own experience as heading a department at the United Nations mm. and having put through a very radical reform and cost-cutting agenda, not easy, it did require a lot of uh, leadership, uh, and that, I think, is something where he can make common cause with the new Secretary General who's called right. for reform and where we need to see the management of the UN made more efficient so we can actually devote more of the resources okay. to the prevention and resolution of conflict, which is driving so much of the world's problems. Right. Mona Khalil, um, before he spoke, uh, before Trump spoke, the UN um, um, General Secretary said that he wanted to hear reasonable and, 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 and kind of you know, logical language about the state of diplomacy around the world. And then what he heard was this speech given by Donald Trump. To what extent can, you know, is there any point to the United Nations anymore when Donald Trump, the leader of the most, world's most powerful nation, is giving a campaign speech, especially about countries like North Korea and Iran? Well, I think we do have to separate between Trump's speech to his own people which is his prerogative to choose the forum by which he chooses to speak to his own people, and the speech, the parts of the speech that were directed to the General Assembly. And those parts may not coincide either in terms of logic or in terms of coherence. But parts of the speech to the General Assembly were indeed worth echoing. First and foremost, that every state owes its citizens, first and foremost, the protection and the ability to deliver basic services. Hopefully he will start with America first and deliver those services to mm -hmm. his own people. But every nation owes its citizens, its civilian citizens in particular, the protection. And those like Bashar al-Assad or Bashir in Sudan or now in Myanmar who are betraying that trust, that sacred trust to protect the civilians in their territories must be held to account. So on that we agree with Mr. Trump that that duty owed to the citizens must be fulfilled and if not accounted for. The second is to respect international law and the relations between nations. And he did say we have to work together. But in calling mm. for the shredding of the agreement okay. with Iran, he asked Iran to respect that very agreement. Right. Okay, I'm afraid we've got to leave it there. We've run out of time. Mona Khalil, Sir Stephen O'Brien, thank you very much indeed.